So the, the overall idea of this retreat is kind of a, a, a dialogue of um, what, what really got us excited about, about organizing it was a sort of greater integration of, of Buddhist practice with um, scientific method, but really sort of um, contemplation acting as the basic understanding uh, in science. Uh, and I think to make it sort of relevant to here, uh, which is largely in therapy, I'll sort of talk a little bit about sort of our, our culture and the lack of place for mystery in it, uh, which I think acts as a barrier uh, for a lot of people in trusting their own capacity for healing. Um, and talk a bit about how science can be more humble, uh, what that looks like as far as collective humility and therefore collective wisdom in science and how that would affect society were we to make progress on that. And what that would look like. Okay. So as Brother Fat Lin said in his original talk, he sort of he talked about how uh, in science, all theories are just theories, um, sort of supposedly, or as an ideal. Uh, we approach theories as just theories, we aren't attached to them. Uh, we're supposed to replace uh, one theory with the other, we're looking to do it uh, constantly. Um, but as we know, that's um, rather difficult to do in practice. What, what really happens, um, is uh, sort of a colorful version of, of, of what uh, Kathleen mentions that science advances one funeral at a time. Uh, is it often an adage that you can draw laughs with in, in, in uh, scientific gatherings? Um, or else it, you know, people are, are uh, one theory is replaced in a lifetime by their forceful experimental evidence uh, as people sort of uh, duel with each other. Uh, and so science as a whole advances and lets go, go of theories, but individuals uh, don't. But then we look at science overall as a, as a field, uh, it has a contention. So if we're to see science as one personality, uh, then it has a particular view, right? So using the language of Buddhism, um, we are using a book to cross the other shore um, when we engage with sort of intellectual theories about the mind. Um, in science, especially where it concerns the mind, uh, there's a bit of a conflict because you are replacing one raft with another. Right? If you are going, if you are constantly improving one theory uh, and then replacing it with the other, and that is the goal, then we're moving from raft to raft. And the question is, sort of humility that it takes, where does it come from, to uh, truly consider the idea of moving to the other shore, that that is the goal, and that the, an ultimate goal can be sort of trusting theory of science. So, okay. Could you rest the mic on your chin? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, So where did, sort of, if we think of science as being, um, and this is to say, Plum Village is basically is in some ways um, is sort of living proof to a lot of people that there's something missing from day-to-day -day experience. Um, that if you believe that rationally we can solve everything, that we can, we can understand everything rational, rationally, we can explain everything, and then there's no space for mystery left, right? You don't need to fundamentally have an experience of mystery in your day-to-day your -day life. You can just have answers. Um, and being outside concepts, as you are in deep meditation, you are fundamentally in mystery. Right? We, we are forced into this experience. When we come across something in day-to-day -day life, uh, which we can't explain, and then we get the sensation of mystery. 
helped me also in meditation experience being outside of my sense for a brief moment to just let go. And when we do that here, you see missing. <coughs> and then you experience something that you've probably been missing from life. And when through clever Zen arts, uh, that happens to us. Uh, all the many participants coming from various parts of westernized culture, uh, they suddenly experience something that they haven't felt uh, in their daily life for a very long time. Uh, and where did we, how did we get there? Uh, well, and, and what part did science play in that? So as we know, you know, at the beginning when science started to progress, uh, we just started to do a few cool experiments. It was experimental philosophy. And we did things like drop heavy and light objects and test whether they fell at the same speed. At the time, people thought that heavier objects would fall faster. It wasn't very, weren't very difficult experiments and we soon figured out that you know, feathers have this thing of resistance. That's why they, they fall slowly. Heavy and light objects actually fall at the same speed. Uh, well, that's really cool. We just figured something out. We, then we figured out some more things like gravity and say, well, we should do more of this science stuff. And pretty soon, you have a theory about just about everything, right? And, and it's now a sign of the times that people, and I'm sure all of you have faced this, right, is that there's an expectation of certainty and control uh, such that if you say, I think this, what's the evidence is considered a valid question. What is the experimental evidence uh, for that particular approach? Prove it to me by showing something in literature. And so science has advanced because basically on many uh, dimensions, we, we kind of figure that it can solve anything. And so the question is, are there fundamentally some blind spots uh, in science that we aren't going to get to, right? Because this is the question. If you think that it, it can make progress in all areas equally, then that's a good question. If you think that there's something that systematically misses, then we have a problem, right? The expectation of certainty and control of sort of this feeling, there's a feeling to as we call it in Buddhism, of intellectual knowledge and being having an expectation for it, or you might even say an addiction to it. An addiction is simply a habit. We can, we can say that it's very strong, uh, has negative consequences, and that we find ourselves unable to resist. Uh, culturally, um, we probably can't resist the, the, the temptation to explain things. Uh, we're just missing the recognition that that might be uh, very dangerous. One example, for example, global, global warming. Um, we want an explanation. We have to know, is it going to kill us or not? The answer is we, that's, that's sort of a ridiculous question. There is no reason why we should expect there to be a definitive answer. We have one planet. We can't run experiments on it, right? By the time there's any empirical evidence, it's far too late. What we know is that there's an organism, perhaps, if you believe Gaia theory, which we're on, which we're dumping things into. Uh, you know, it's a bit like we have some models, and there's no bypass, right? The Wright brothers had some had theories about, about flying. Um, they could sort of explain them to people, um, and people would be skeptical, but eventually the plane flew, and then they discarded the theories. Right? There's never going to be anything like that for global warming. You can't ask for So the idea that there's some other uh, type of knowledge where science wouldn't be very good at is quite ancient. Okay, so mysticism is defined in the dictionary two ways. One is vague or ill-defined religious or spiritual belief, especially as associated with the belief in the occult. That's probably what most of us sort of associate it with. It's sort of become a dirty word. 
But the first one is the belief that the spiritual apprehension of knowledge, of knowledge inaccessible to the intellect may be attained through contemplation and self-surrender. That just means that there's a such thing as mysteries, right? That you can contemplate and you can know them by in a way by staring at them. Uh, that you can't know by thinking about them analytically. Now, if we think about um, that, obviously Buddhists are mystics. Um, the second definition they at least believe that. Not that it's the only useful form of knowledge, but certainly there are types of knowledge which are inaccessible to the intellect. And that would be a blind spot, certainly. Uh, so what do we do with that? How do we reacquire our faith in that? Um, it strikes me as the first way to ask that question is simply, okay, given that something's true, what is the chance that we have scientific evidence to prove or disprove it? And if you say, well, actually, we wouldn't know either way, then the lack of scientific evidence for or against something uh, bears, you know, means that basically this question of what is the evidence has uh, very real, real relevance in some cases. Um, and that, I think, is something that we can I'll do more um, reflection on it. Okay. So, for example, to take an extreme example, nirvana is the highest happiness. It's a sort of crass formulation of, uh, in contention, the ancient contention of, of Buddhism. What chance is there that science would weigh in on something like that? Um, we can't directly measure pleasure, so we have to rely on internal reports of pleasure. Um, we can't instruct people to cease thinking. We could, but actually, we can look at the whole Plum Village practice as the art of getting people to follow the simple instruction, follow your breath. People spend decades doing it. Uh, I've heard it's quite difficult, <laughs> even if you... It's your full-time job. I know as a, as a part-time job, it's it's quite difficult. Uh, and so, if that is the, the contention, um, how do you test it? We can do little things like mindfulness programs, right? but that it sh can be proved that it's uh, worth your whole life or our culture's whole uh, trajectory to pursue more contemplation. Very, very difficult, right? Now we think about, you know, what does it look like to internalize that idea? Okay, you are around a sangha. This is the, the real contention of Plum Village, where around a sangha, the more people uh, that are deep in this sort of mystical knowledge, the more contagious you are for it. The more present you are, the more available the contemplative so Plum Village, when you come to this place, you experience what we call mindfulness energy. Um, scientists who are skeptical of that, that just means qualia in, in you know, your native language. Uh, and also it's worth noting that Aristotle's concept of energy had much similarity to qualia. The physical uh, concept of energy is by analogy to that. Uh, and so there's actually the idea of, of direct experience of energy, of energy as, as an ancient uh, Greek idea. Uh, but you see this mind, this, this particular quality of, of mindfulness just comes to you uh, by being around other people. And so the contention that a whole society uh, could create a massive ability for contemplation uh, by devoting itself to this mystical capacity is 
not really something that we're going to run controlled experiments on, right? We can do some MBSR courses and we can show that people have increased mindfulness and decreased suffering. Uh, and science can bring some things to that by theoretical principles, the simple idea of cognitive dissonance that you've all heard of, right? Cognitive dissonance is just the idea that we have con conflict between two things in mind, then there's suffering. If you, what you see is outside, is reflected inside, you have a clean mirror, then there would be no difference between what you perceive and what you see. Therefore, no suffering, right? We can use some theory to support that, but the uh, difficulty of executing that uh, is something else that we also would need as part of this experiment to prove that uh, we can do it, it's practicable. Again, not something that you can really uh, prove very easily. And so part of scientific humility would just be realizing that much. That actually, though we can identify a few principles, there's something called an art, right? And arts are um, informed by principles which we can distill through rational inquiry, uh, but they remain in arts, right? There's never going to be a science of painting. There's never going to be a science of, of, of painting. Uh, it can be sort of informed by rules of perspective, by understanding of color. Uh, pointillism, obviously, is inspired by some advances in how we put together colors. All these things, uh, there's, been, there's been informing of, of art by science, but the, the actual uh, pursuit of, of uh, the best uh, particular response to a particular situation is, is always up to a sensitive individual. And that's what people are looking for uh, all the time in, in therapy. You know, the question of how to escape suffering is a question as large as the human mind itself. Like, what can go wrong with the human mind? And as large as the world itself, what can go wrong with the human mind in the world? You know, the idea that there are uh, principles that create a science that, uh, or a set of rules that give you a perfect answer to everybody's particular uh, questions is sort of, you know, a, a fantasy, right? In which, in the idea that there should be uh, a, a perfect um, direction towards somebody's action to relieve suffering is, is reflects a sort of attachment, right, to the sensation of certainty and control. So I think, to close, it's, I think what uh, the practice can offer is that we directly engage with our sensations. So we realized, the Buddha realized that um, you weren't attached to the explanation, but to the sensations that, were, that come with it, or you aren't attached to a fruit, but the pleasure that comes with it. We can learn to sort of realize that we are actually addicted to certain sensations. It's sort of a drug of choice in our culture. And by releasing that attachment, uh, we can directly work to create space for mystery. Uh, and by acquiring experiences like we have in Plum Village, um, we can get direct experience of the other uh, capacity.